I'm Jordan. And I'm Rosanna. And on this podcast, we explore how to take life off autopilot and relentlessly pursue a life worth living together. together. Hello, and welcome to Season 8, Episode 6 of the Relentless Pursuit Podcast, Into the Metaverse, an interview with Dr. Andrew Maynard. So off and on, Rosanna and I have had conversations related to the future and technological innovations and this term that has been hyped over the past several years called the metaverse. So to get more information, we had a chance to speak with Professor Andrew Maynard. Andrew Maynard is a scientist, author, and founder of Arizona State University's Future of Being Human community, where he's also a professor in the ASU School for the Future of Innovation and Society. Andrew is an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, is a member of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research President's Advisory Council, has served on a number of national academies of sciences committees, and has testified before congressional committees on several occasions. Although he's a trained, he's trained as a physicist, Andrew's work increasingly cuts across boundaries as it explores the ethical and socially beneficial development and use of transformative new technologies. He's worked with a number of organizations on approaches to ensuring new technologies benefit as many people as possible, and as a regular contributor to the WEF annual list of top 10 emerging technologies. In addition to his academic writing, Andrew's work has appeared in publications ranging from the Washington Post and Scientific American to Slate, Salon, and One Zero. He co-hosts the podcast Mission Interplanetary with former NASA astronaut Katie Coleman, and is the author of the books Films from the Future, The Technology and Morality of Sci-Fi Movies, and Future Rising, A Journey from the Past to the Edge of Tomorrow. He can be found online at andrew.maynard.net or on Twitter at at 2020 science. And also in real life, you'll find him buried in a good book. In this conversation, you'll hear us define the metaverse, the kinds of activities available there, and the role of video games. The values of science fiction, what it means to be human, and other questions we should be asking, whether or not tech advancements should scare us, different generational responses to what's coming in the metaverse, the parents' role in guiding their children as technology shifts, who is working on the metaverse and who will have the control, the nature of reality in a digital world, and human problems the metaverse won't solve. So without further ado, here is our interview with Andrew Maynard. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us on the Relentless Pursuit podcast. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Same here. Um, so we'll just dive right in and ask you, when folks are referring to the metaverse, what, what do they mean? <laughs> Beyond the hype, you mean? Yes. Um, yeah, so I, there's so much hype around the, the metaverse. Um, but in essence, it's this idea of creating a, a digital environment where we can do pretty much anything in it that we do in the, the physical world. So almost it's like developing this parallel of the physical world. So if you want to play games with others in it, if you want to interact socially with them, if you want to get married in it, if you want to sort of build a commercial empire in it, this is what people are trying to do. Now, of course, we're only scratching the surface at the moment, but it's it's this sort of almost hubristic idea that anything you can do in real life, you can do in digital life. So for me, my, my biggest question is just because we can, should we? I mean, we should. <laughs> right. Yeah. And like, it's just, it's really mind boggling to me and it's driving me crazy. Like, that's great, but it's not real. And his question to me back is, well, what is real? And it kind of starts the whole conversation. Well, and you reference this because you write about Jurassic Park in right. your book, Films of the uh, Films from the Future. Yes. And that's my favorite line from the, uh, the, the movie. With Jeff Goldblum. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's like, just because we, or we were so interested to see if we could do it, we'd never stop to ask if we should. If we should. Yes. So should yep. we be doing this? Yeah, I, actually, it's a really good question. So I, I've spent many years at the cutting edge of technology innovation. And I, I think there are a couple of things which I keep on coming back to. One is it's actually incredibly hard to stop things happening because there's never any one person who decides whether we should go or stop with a, a new technology. It's just an organic thing that happens. So it's almost like there is this, this flow of technology innovation that, that's happening. And the bigger question to me is, how do you actually channel that in ways which are useful? So yes, 
I don't know whether we should or shouldn't with the metaverse, but it's going to happen anyway. I, you just look at sort of how people are sort of being creative with, with technologies. Um, the bigger question is, how can we actually do this in a way which is actually good for people, that, that doesn't diminish us as humans, that doesn't destroy lives, but actually opens up possibilities? That's a really, really tricky one, especially when things are at such an early age at the moment and nobody's quite sure what this is going to look like. Yeah, so we really are at the the cusp, like you said, like the hype of starting to like learn and, and develop like what the metaverse is and, and there's right. kind of speculation of, about what we can do there. Um, one of the things I was really interested in is um, reading about the current developments towards the metaverse and some of the visionaries working towards that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it surprised me to see how much video games were yeah. really on the, the cutting edge of uh, like helping give the future of the metaverse shape and so specific games uh, that uh, I'm familiar with that our kids play are mm -hmm. Fortnite, Minecraft and Roblox I don't know if right. I, that you want to throw in there too um, but can you talk about the role that gaming has towards yeah. what we imagine the metaverse will become I, actually, it's a, it's a really good point, and we've seen this, this really close coupling between gaming and, and tech innovation for, for years now. And in fact, if you think of the, the graphical processing units that sort of dominate our computers these days, those all came out of gaming. Um, so absolutely, we, we see this, this trend where what people are passionate about uh, when it comes to gaming, and it really is a very sophisticated environment. I, this is not your Tetris. I, so you, it, it shows, <laughs> shows sort of how sort of low down on the, the sort of scheme of things I am. I think of gaming as sort of playing Tetris and stuff like that. This is deep, sophisticated stuff. And it's absolutely driving not only the technologies, but what we can do with them. And then you're seeing sort of the... Um, the, the add-ons from that where people are seeing what you can do in a very sophisticated gaming environment and they're saying, well, hey, maybe we can extend this to the business environment or the social environment. Um, now, how far that will go, I don't know. I think that you'll find that gaming is going to be the catalyst because there you've got this passionate community that really wants the best, the fastest, um, the, the lowest latency technology. But I think that that will end up being the catalyst for other applications where people say, hey, we can do other stuff with this. And to me, it's like, it makes sense to keep it like the gaming, right? Like, sure. Now, right. We're, we grew up in the Mario generation. So Mario wore right. his jumpsuit with his red shirt and Luigi, right. And then very 2D scrolling. Screen. Right. And then later right. on, it could be princess or toe, you know, like it evolved and you had more choice and now, but you know, now I hear my boys talking about their skins and they want us to use real dollars to buy virtual bucks, <laughs> buy skin <laughs> for their character. And to me, it's like, what? Like how, why is this a thing? Right, right. And why are we having to put hard money down on the table for this? <laughs> <laughs> and I get that, like, the games are now free to download, and this is, like, a way to generate mm -hmm. money. So, you know, in the, in the, like, in technology and in gaming, like, okay, great, it's a way to generate money, like, you get it. But then yep. when you're looking at taking that and then moving that into, like, a workspace or into relationships or into families, and you're looking yeah. at replacing what's real with something on a screen that's where i start to get a like i feel like the dinosaur that i'm like it's not real it's well i and i'm with you there and i but i think that this is sort of where that frisson between very real dangers and very real opportunities come in um and i i think we can't underplay the fact that there are challenges here and there are challenges with um, tech innovators and big corporations trying to press on society something that they think we should adopt. Um, and you're going to have some people that buy into that um, and they run into problems as they do. I, you know what it's like with kids. Um, if somebody tries to sell them the latest shiny thing, it's easy to convince them that they have to have this without any sort of mental thought about whether this is really a good thing. So we've absolutely got that pressure with people trying to convince members of society that they have to buy into this and that can be really dangerous on the other hand you can sort of see maybe in sort of 10 15 years a future where if we do this right there are clearly going to be some potential benefits um so now you imagine um sort of families where you're physically separated you can't sort of engage with each other whether it's sort of parents and kids or whether it's sort of um partners which are separated what if we had a future where they could have meaningful relationships at a distance, where it felt like it was as real as if they were together? Um, and actually, I'm thinking especially of, say, you've got elderly parents who are maybe living even in another country. 
can this be a system where you can actually build and maintain those relationships? And maybe yes. Maybe it's a system where if you're looking for medical advice, you can have the best possible medical advice from anywhere in the world by going into the metaverse. So you can definitely see these benefits, but how we navigate those really sort of yucky, nasty sides of what could happen versus the good sides is really difficult. Can you t talk more about that idea of presence? Because yes. that seems to be the, I don't know, like the, the mysterious part right now. Like we, we yeah. understand what it's like to interact through text messages or even FaceTime. Um, so how might the metaverse bring that to a, a sure. Presence and, and I must confess, this is where a lot of my skepticism comes in. So, so the idea is there are layers to this. So, yes, we're used to sort of interacting with a screen in two dimensions. Um, the the next layer is three dimensional immersiveness. So you put on your headset and you can look around and you feel as if you're in this three dimensional environment. So it feels more immersive. It immersive. It feels like you're more connected, although it's still pretty clunky at the moment. The next step is to introduce feel so haptic touch there so not only does it look like you're in a totally different environment but you can actually feel it so maybe you could reach out and and touch somebody's hand and actually feel that that connection and we're beginning to get there with the technology and then people are beginning to sort of talk about sort of um possible senses like the sense of smell and stuff like that try to make this as immersive as possible so from a technology innovators perspective this is really exciting they're basically sort of saying what can we possibly do to make this really cool and really interesting the problem is as humans we have this amazing sense of presence and and these amazing senses that, that create it they're very very sophisticated um and at the moment we're creating a very very crude facsimile of that in the the metaverse and the danger is we're going to be so wowed with something which is crude that we forget about what it's like to truly live in the real world uh, well, I think that's the part that is scary for me. Right. I mean, we already see this with our phones. Um, and I'd say, well, I have a couple of thoughts on that. But, but we, we have this idea of, all right, I'm, I'm in the kitchen around my family, but mm. my mind is like mentally in tune with my Instagram feed at the moment, right? There's, right. you know, lose a sense of presence of your surroundings. And I've done this where my kids are like, dad, dad. Like, right, right. And you're buried there. Yes. I, so I can't imagine, you know, being in an even more immersive place, but still being physically present in my yeah. home and like how, how much that that kind of like draws. Yeah. Us. And I, so I, you know, I, I worry about the same thing. I don't know whether it's going to go that way or not. Certainly at the moment, there's a big difference between just being able to glance down at a phone and putting on a headset. I mean, the, these headsets are clunky and the first five minutes are amazing, but then the fatigue begins to set in and you quite a lot of people sort of breathe a sigh of relief when they, they take it off. Um, so just sort of human nature and human physiology sort of means that it's much harder to sort of become addicted to this, although there are accounts of people sort of having that sort of addiction already. Um, but I think it'll be a long time before this um, pulls us away from reality in the same way as, as phones do at the moment. But there are probably sort of other really sort of big challenges about sort of how people get addicted to these environments um, and lose touch with the reality around them. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are obsessed with like our screens and our devices, and it does kind of pull us away. But at the end of the day, we we live in the real world, we eat in the real world. That's it. Like we have to raise our children, we need to drive like there are things that we physically have to do. If we're so plugged in, you know, to a device or to other people virtually, like, there's still a world here that exists. And so right. And like, for me, it's like, how, how far before we start to erase what's in front of us for what is what is that? That's yeah. right. So so there is a bit of good news here. And that is most people, the evidence is are reasonably sensible um, and are able to adapt. And <laughs> I'm to glad find that, that, that that's, that's your take on it. That's good. That's I know good. That, that, you know, there are always those that just sort of seem to sort of completely defy that. that. <laughs> um, but one of the reasons I say this is I, we had these sort of conversations when the internet really sort of began to take off um, 20 years ago, especially with kids. And I remember when our kids were younger, the conversations around uh how are we going to navigate this? Our, our kids are being sucked into this world we don't understand, we don't think is healthy. What can we do to protect them? And what ended up happening, certainly with our kids, and I saw this story elsewhere, was the kids were smart enough and savvy enough 
to understand how to integrate this digital world into their, their physical world and their personal world. And they ended up teaching us how to be smart about this. And I think we'll find the same happening, certainly with a lot of people, that they see what they can get out of the metaverse, but they don't lose touch with the real lives that they're living, and they develop sophisticated ways of merging the two together. And to me, that means that what we've actually got to be careful of is, is the people at the periphery, the people that can't navigate this in that sophisticated way that are going to get sucked in and harmed. But I think for most people, eventually they'll work out how to actually make use of this without losing a sense of their physical identity and their physical community. I uh, was a relatively late adopter when it came to the cell phone or the smartphone, um, as I would probably everyone else we knew had one before mm -hmm. I was like, okay, fine. Um, but I can't imagine if I had, if I had kept that hard line, you know, what a disadvantage it would be if I didn't have a smartphone and I would struggle to send casual texts or right. even like have a cursory presence on social media, um, checking email, like, you know, all the, all the benefits that come with that. Um, so I, I would, a lot of, you're right, like a lot of these conversations we're having now remind me of when I was a kid in yep. the 90s and people were like, oh, what, what's what's the internet? What's the information superhighway? And like kind of some of the basic understandings of that. Um, but I would imagine at some point someone who didn't adopt the internet or someone who didn't get a yeah. smartphone or social media uh, in, to a certain extent is is left behind. I, um, yeah, I I, I think to a certain extent, um, and already I, we still have people that, that won't use cell phones. I, I have a colleague who has just cracked and bought a cell phone literally over the last two or three months. Um, <laughs> and she actually, she managed fine without it. So I actually, I don't think questions around exclusion are as big as we sometimes make them out to be. But but certainly there is a conversation to be had there about whether if you are not an adopter, you end up missing out on some things that other people have access to. Well, I mean, my, my grandmother is 90 years old, was not born in this country, you know, came in her 40s or 50s, you know, like, does it has a cell phone, but not a smartphone, like, mm -hmm. you know, she's never going to be in the metaverse. And right. she's probably going to do just fine. Um, you know, and for us, I think it'll be kind of like that we have the choice of how much we want to be involved. Um, but I know sometimes when we talk about our kids, we kind of wonder, like, how, how will their involvement be different than ours, because they're a few generations removed from where we are, right? And what yes. will that look like for them moving forward? But you even saying that, like, they'll, they'll understand how to use it to their advantage. But you're saying like it's it's not going to end as a ready player one or as um, what's I don't think it will. OK, yes, yes. Yeah, I, you know, I, I may be wrong here, uh, but just from what I see around human behavior indicates that, that most people are going to come back to what they're really comfortable with as humans, which is that physical interaction. Um, and maybe they'll be seduced a little bit by the, the metaverse, but they'll eventually come back to what they're comfortable with and what they're use, used to, and they'll adapt. I, I, I do want to bring this up too, like in regards to, I see this with teenagers a lot. Um, you know, a lot of them report using certain apps like TikTok primarily. Yep. Um, for hours, even when they know it's not yes, healthy, yes. even when they would say like, I, I really don't want to, like I'll flick it on and I get like my, my little entertainment from it, but being able to draw themselves away from it can yeah. be really challenging. And we're also seeing um, like, you know, record numbers of anxiety and depression, yep. uh, which it, it's hard to determine causation, but a lot of folks um, like Gene Twenge like points to there's, they, they, there's a sense that it's connected yes yeah, yeah. do we yeah. So, so i mean so do we see like this this potential for like even more like immersive kinds of experiences drawing individuals especially youth like away from the things that they do value I, again i i think it, these are really important questions to ask i don't think there are any clear answers um and i this is where i flip from being optimistic to <laughs> pessimistic um you can tell I'm, I'm sort of somewhat schizophrenic here um one of the things that does worry me is something we've seen with social media which is an intentionality from service providers to keep 
people hooked. Um, and there have been a lot of conversations around this. And I, I think you're exactly right, although the evidence isn't conclusive, and I, I'm not sure it ever will be, that there's this connection between um, social and mental disorders, especially like anxiety and social media use. There are, there are strong indications that there's something going on here. Um, and part of it is because this is an environment which has been designed to monetize attention. So the more you can grab somebody's attention, the more somebody is making money. Um, and there is no reason to believe that that will not happen in the metaverse unless people think very, very carefully about how to do this in socially responsible ways. So I think it's it's a very real concern. Um, I still feel that the that sort of the, the mental cost of entry to the metaverse is going to be high enough that it's going to be harder to do that than it is with a cell phone. A cell phone is easy. You just flip it out and look at it. Putting a headset on is it's a much bigger investment um, in sort of what you do and what you immerse yourself into. But at the same time, I can see companies sitting around thinking, how can we make sure that once people are in, they're going to stay there and they're going to buy our stuff and they're going to sort of um, tell others about our stuff and get others into there. So then how do we how do we stop that? And going back to my earlier question, uh, my earlier comments, is it enough to rely on human savvy or do we need more? Do we need companies that are thinking more about social responsibility? Do we need regulations? I, I don't know, but I think we've got to have these conversations. Yeah, I think that's the the part that uh, is scary to me is thinking, and of course we think of Ready Player One. Um, right. Or actually, let me reference that too, because in that film, the, the, you know, I can see why people care so much about this like metaverse game world is because mm -hmm. Like you could do anything, you could be anybody there, yep. but you see the the flip side is in reality, like it's all deteriorating. Um, right. Relationships are very fractured between people in real life and the, the physical environment itself is, is um, deteriorating as well. So I think it's interesting, like just in science fiction, how uh, a lot of it is dystopian. Like in, in right, that, right. And it projects. But, but actually, but, but this is what I, I love about science fiction, because you can imagine those sort of futures, which end up being a wake up call for us. So yes, I, I think Ready Player One is, is probably an extreme in terms of that immersiveness. Um, and that's that that sort of bait and switch where you, you think that you're doing something in the metaverse, but actually somebody's manipulating it. Um, I, I'm not sure we'll go down that pathway. But the fact that someone can imagine that, and visualize that in a very, very sort of emotive way gives us a pause to think about where we're going and where we don't want to go with this technology. All right. So you mentioned headsets. Um, what is, is that the, do you see like the main equipment um, necessary to access? Actually, yeah, yes and no. So I know this is what a lot of people focus on with the metaverse. They think about virtual reality, putting on one of these bulky headsets um, so you can sort of visually feel as if you're immersed in a three-dimensional digital environment. And of course, that's how a lot of people will experience this, either whether they're gaming or whether they're going on, on virtual tours of different places or even whether they're in meetings. But actually, the, the metaverse is much, much bigger than that. That's just one. One little part of it. And when you look at this from a commercial perspective, um, it's really about building digital infrastructure where you can do stuff. You can have companies, you can have commerce, you can have communities. And the headsets are just one way of getting into this, but they're only one way. Um, and I know, I think it's Meta is working on, um, well, they, they, they just came out with a new headset yesterday, they announced, but they're working on um, like... Uh, augmented reality and glasses. Right, right. And actually, so so this is also where things get really weird and squirrely. So I I I hugely believe that the metaverse is never going to take off as a virtual reality environment with these headsets. Mm -hmm. Simply because um again it comes back to that first five minutes are great. And then the thing begins to feel heavy and bulky. You get a headache, your eyes begin to get weary. Um, so I, I don't think it's a it's a start for many people. But if we could get the technology so you could just put a pair of glasses on, or even if you could just put contacts in and it immerses you in, that then becomes a game changer. I don't know whether we'll get there, but if we do, that's, I think, when all bets are off. Because again, the, the cost of entry is so low. Just putting on a pair of glasses and being immersed is so much easier than putting on a bulky headset. I was thinking about... Um... 
Yeah, I think Mark Zuckerberg did, did say, like, uh, I forget the quote exactly, but putting a supercomputer into glasses is right. one of the greatest technological challenges that um, they're working towards. But why, like, why stop at contacts? Why not just ocular <laughs> implants? Right. And of course, then you go to some of the work that people like Elon Musk are doing. So his company Neuralink are looking at, at brain computer interfaces, the, these little implants, which will have 30 odd thousand connections into your brain. Um, and the, the actually the vision there really scares part of my brain and really excites the other part, the, the, the techie <laughs> part. I think this is amazing. But the other part things, what what on earth are we doing here? But yes, I mean, sort of, you listen to some of the rhetoric there, and the rhetoric starts off around gaming. I mean, it says, wouldn't it be cool if you could wirelessly connect your brain to a computer so you can sort of interact far faster than you can through your hands? Then why not connect that to the optical parts of your brain so you can actually beam stuff straight in to your brain? Um, we're a long, long way from that because our brains are incredibly complex, but this is what people are trying to achieve. And that that is a really big game changer, even if we get close to that. I was going to say, we couldn't get some people to take a vaccine. So I don't know how 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 ready people are going to <laughs> plug in to their brainwaves to get into a computer system. I mean, but but it's, you know, the, the weird thing is here, I guarantee there's going to be this, this little group of people who would absolutely refuse to get a vaccine, but they'll be first in line to get the brain. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. That was going to be my next point. <laughs> right. Couldn't line up for that, but they're on for the gaming. But at least right. that's the context you can take off. Like you have a lot more autonomy over when you choose to engage with that. Once See, that's that's it. Yes. Permanent. Yeah. But I, these are the sorts of questions I ask my students. And and every class I, I take, I have some students who will say, I'll be there for the brain implant. Don't care about the downsides. I want one of those. Mm -hmm. And and I wonder too about that or other like other kinds of just like mental or physical modifications that we can you know, do to ourselves. Yeah. Um, like do we, are those who eventually choose to not engage with that, um, are they at some degree of disadvantage? Sure. Are, are they disadvantaged? Um, and I, again, I'm not sure that this will become a big issue in the next 10 years, but maybe the next 20 to 40 years, I think this is going to become an increasingly big issue so you end up with that, that technological disparity in society where the, the people that decide to adopt or can afford to adopt or are part of the system have that that advantage although there is a downside and, and this is something that I've, I've written about and I find intriguing so you go back to the, the brain implant um, if you have one of these super duper brain implants who owns the implant what happens when it needs a service what happens when it needs an upgrade if you decide not to pay for the upgrade are you some, somehow sort of disadvantaged? Does the whole thing close down and you end up sort of um, not being as, as smart or as connected as anybody else in the world? Mm -hmm. That really scares me because in the end, the corporations end up owning you if you're not careful, rather than sort of you having that level of human autonomy that most people want. The, the especially scary part for me is when I think about uh, like a, a future baby that's born, is it the ethical thing for parents to you know have the the implant installed you know upon her um right right so that so that like <laughs> at the risk of doing your child a disservice by yes all, yeah. all the other children who are given those intellectual advantages or those yeah. advantages i so that I, this does get scary so i actually you play that scenario out which i think is actually maybe sort of 20 30 years from now a realistic scenario so people have talked a lot about genetic enhancement of, of kids and is it ethical to have your embryo or your unborn child genetically enhanced so they're going to have an advantage in life we're a long long way from that i mean it's theoretically possible possibly but there are so many biological and ethical hurdles to overcome that i don't think we'll see it for a long long time but um computer implants now that i think is closer so you can absolutely imagine a market where as your kid is born they get the implant um and the implant evolves and grows with them so you then have this technological a well you have a technological advantage as long as you're paying your dues and as long as you're getting the upgrades um it raises some really knotty ethical and social questions well but then i just think of my phone right like how 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 often can you get a new iphone right like once right. a year but how many times do they send like a push you know like a 
Yep. You know, like for, you know, and what happens when it glitches or what happens when it cracks <laughs> out or like, then what? Right. Then we're just screwed, right? We're just down for the day. Like, like is, is it going to be, is it going to be normal to be talking to somebody and all of a sudden they sort of freeze and they, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I think about that, but I also think like, let's just say like freedom of speech, for example, like let's say yes. you say something, you engage in some activity that, you know, because of your connection to this company, you violated their terms of service yep. with a belief that you hold, could they like, you know, restrict your, your service or your use, your use of your brain. Yep. This yep. Brain. So, so if you want to get really, really dystopian, take that one step further. And, and this to me is why we desperately need these conversations around this. So with a brain um, machine interface. So yes, imagine this, this contract clause that, that, that says, you're not allowed to sort of say or do certain things. Otherwise, you sort of violate this and we're going to restrict your services. But remember, these brain implants have the ability to affect how your brain works as well as just read how it works. So what if they now put a, a, a little algorithm in there that actually modifies your brain? It modifies your mood, say, or modifies your ability to think. So rather than clearing brain fog, it increases brain fog. Um, instead of increasing happiness, it decreases happiness because you violated the rules. Um, now, this is getting incredibly dystopian, but we're heading towards a future where some of these things might possibly be conceivable. Right. And then who holds the keys to make sure that- Who holds the keys? Yes. The government, for good. the people. Yeah. yeah. But depending yes. on who's in charge and their agenda, it shifts the whole conversation of what's acceptable. Yes. Yeah. So interestingly, that that raises the question of, well, who should be having these conversations? Is this government that should be doing this? Should companies be responsible? Is it down to consumers and, and ordinary people to sort of say this far and no further with these technologies? Mm -hmm. And is there an answer? Is it everyone? Is <laughs> so, it we're, we're all stakeholders in this? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I yeah, different people have different approaches, and I, I I tend sort of with with my work to sort of take the the approach that that everyday people have got a major stake in this. Um, if you don't want to be used, you need to be informed, um, and that's where I think everybody has got the opportunity to understand not only what's going on, but how it potentially impacts them, and how they can be part of steering things towards the sort of future they want. Um, and I, you don't need to have deep technological knowledge. You just need to be an ordinary human being that has some sense of what's important to you, what's going to affect you, and what's going to affect what's precious to you, and how you can actually push back and make sure that you get a future which you actually want to be part of. And I think that's the important thing, that this isn't a conversation for like the 1% or for professors at a university, like we all have stake in, in what happens from now to 30 years from now. And so right. like, what do we say is important to us? What do we value and how far are we willing to go? Yep. Um, but, you know, even you don't have to be super educated to have read a book, uh, to have watched a sci-fi movie to see that like, while things seem great, there is also another side to that. And that That's may, it. Should make everybody hesitant while, while we do want to push things further, whether we land on the moon or create, you know, things that cure cancer, that's great. But there's, there's, there are things that we need to pay attention to. Yes. Yeah. And I, 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 that's exactly right. I think um, pretty much everybody has some ability and some agency to not only be part of the conversation, but to make it very clear to the corporations that are developing these technologies that there are some things that are okay and some things that are not. And at the end of the day, corporations are out to make money. And I actually, let me qualify that most of the people in these corporations are actually out to make life better for people. A lot of them actually have this vision of a better future, but they're part of a system which is there to make money. So if you as the consumer say, we're not going to buy into this, they're going to have to modify their plans. So that's where part of this consumer power comes in. Yeah, I, I don't know if I, I trust human nature enough ah, to always make yeah. the, right, the, the right decision. And that's, so actually, I think of the the matrix, um, mm -hmm. which is destined to come up in this conversation. But uh, one scene that always interested me, I don't remember the character's name, but the, the guy who is in the real world, mm -hmm. but he asks the agents to get plugged back into the matrix. Yes. And uh, that always interested me because I'm like, this, this guy is actually onto something like for him, like life could be a lot better 
in yeah. this imaginary world than in the real world where i mean it's just struggle and fight and they eat you know porridge you know three meals a day yeah and i so yes and i i remember that part of the scene and it's uh, although the the film and it really does raise this question of what does it mean to be human what does it mean to have value in life um, because I did, it's nice to think that sort of being authentically human is the most important thing, but to people who are really struggling, maybe a different life is what they really want. And in the case of the matrix, it was that comfort of being in what was effectively a simulation, but actually having an identity and happiness there rather than being in the real world and being utterly miserable. Mm -hmm. And it, it, this is a really, really tricky question it raises. Um, and that the question is, should we deny people the ability or the opportunity to be happy, even if they're not in the real world? That's a great question. Well, I've heard that come up with social media. Um, right. Or I think it was prison inmates. Like, are you denying them a fundamental right by denying them access to social media? I, I'm sure there's some nuances to that. But... <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm not sure we're at quite at the point where sort of social media is on the same level as sort of food and shelter. But, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. so some might argue. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but, and that's when we're having the conversation about like the metaverse and what it looks like or what our relationship will be or how much we buy in. Um, he's like, but wouldn't it be nice if you put on your glasses and even if your house isn't immaculate, when you put on those glasses, you look and you've got a Van Gogh on the wall and you've got a piano in this room. And, yeah. and I looked at him and I said, but it isn't real. Like what we have is good. Actually, what yep. we have is great. And so to convince ourselves that we need to be somewhere better, like what is that really doing? Does it really make us happier? Yeah. Like once you reach a certain level of like food, shelter, and love, like anything yeah. over that doesn't make you happy. So right. You and I, I maybe, I know, and maybe this is sort of part of the, the law of, of sort of consumerism, where we're constantly told we have to have more, we have to have a better life. Um, and I, I, thankfully, there's actually quite a lot of pushback um, on this in society with people realizing that happiness doesn't lie in more consumer goods, but it lies in very different areas. But constant, you're right, constantly we've been being bombarded by being told we have to have more. And maybe part of this conversation is helping people understand what they truly need to live a happy and fulfilled life rather than what somebody else is telling them they need. Yeah, and I, you can, this I think gets into the world of speculation, but one example I was thinking of is, you know, we put on the glasses, so everything is augmented reality. We can, you know, purchase, you know, some some NFT uh, mm -hmm. smart work and hang it on our our wall digitally somehow. Um, but even like with one another, right? We we already like do our hair and our, our makeup and, you know, mm -hmm. but we put glasses on and have like a, a self-program to project our, yep. our, you know, an ideal, we already have filters like on Snapchat and Instagram. Um, I mean, would that make us happier as everyone perceived us as, as younger and more attractive? Yeah. And see, th this is where I, I honestly don't know the answer because if you were to <laughs> ask me, I would say, heck no. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun sort of being in digital reality and sort of appearing slightly different and having different things around you. I desperately hanker after the real world. Give me something that's simple and real rather than sophisticated and digital. And I'd be happy every day of the week, but I don't think I'm the norm here. Um, and this is where I actually struggle in my own work, trying to understand where other people are coming from with this. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because that's how I feel. And so I, I don't know how old you are. We're, we're both 39. We're about to turn 40, right? We have young kids. And so like, for me, he's like, well, maybe that's just you. Like, what if people, I'm like, I don't know, but it's not real. Like to me, I'm like this, you know, like, I'm, I'm smart. I'm educated. Like I know better. And so for me, the substitution does not become the real, like I, right. I'm buying into that. Well, I think about how much care our kids put into like their, their Fortnite skin. They're like, right. Like I'll play with them, but I just have like all the defaults. They're like, dad, like you, you look ridiculous. I'm like, <laughs> it, it literally doesn't matter, but they don't understand why it doesn't matter to me. And I don't understand. It, why it is important to them. Yes. Yeah. And, and this is what I think is really hard to, to navigate. However, it does raise, I think, something really important here. And I've talked a lot about sort of we need to talk about these things. We also need ways of understanding where different people are, are coming from. Um, so this this idea of dialogue and empathy and rather than assuming we know what's good for other people, actually finding out 
what is important to them, what brings them happiness, what actually gives them quality of life, and then working out as a society how to navigate that. I think too often we just assume that we know best. Um, of course, I know best, but <laughs> I'm sure everybody else doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one thing that you had mentioned in a previous interview, I think it was from uh, PBS, mm. was that we may eventually struggle with determining the difference between what is real and yeah. what is not. Um, yes. Could you comment on that a little bit more? Yeah, so I mean, th this is deeply speculative, and this is going sort of a long, long, long way into the, the future. Um, but there is certainly this argument to be made and and this sort of comes into simulation theory that one day our digital world or our computers will be so sophisticated that they will be able to replicate the electrical signals that all of our senses feed to our brains so we won't be able to distinguish between reality and the the digital space we're in um, and it makes sense if you think that everything we use to perceive the the reality around us is just a bunch of digital signals going to a, a bunch of neurons and synapses. So if we could sort of take that over, why wouldn't we be able to immer immerse ourselves into a, a fake reality? Um, it's actually, it's a lot harder than that, but in principle, we should be able to achieve that. But if we achieve that, A, how will we tell the difference between what's real and what's not? And B, will it matter? <laughs> Uh, I remember there's a few films and scenarios that come to mind, uh, but I watched the movie Inception recently, mm -hmm. uh, which deals more with with dreams and it's, it's quasi sci-fi. Yes. Yep. But um, that ends up being like one of the major conversation points is how how do you know what, like when you get back to reality versus living in someone else's dream? That's right. Yes. Yes. If you're having a dream that's more preferable to your potential reality, then is it is it worth returning to reality in the first place? Yeah, yeah. It leaves on that note. It it does. Though actually, one important question there is who controls your reality. Um, so yeah, maybe it doesn't matter if it's a reality where you have just as much agency. But if somebody controls that reality, that would jar a lot with me. And I think of well, I just think of like a a game that's that's so immersive. You know the 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 NPCs. Uh, mm -hmm. The AI that controls the NPCs is so lifelike. Yep. Right? We we could potentially develop very real um, like relationships with these non-playable characters. Right. Uh, yes. Role and a meaning <laughs> in a in a world that is is generated you know, like specifically for us and for our adventures. Yeah. Uh, that that to me seems really appealing. I could be a hero, a true hero, <laughs> in this fictitious <laughs> story that I'm playing, and I have a role. Like I, I wouldn't want to return to reality where I'm nobody. But but is but is that true? I mean, I, I I get the fantasy there, but also I always come back to sort of basic human makeup and behavior. Um, and I think that sometimes our, our fantasies sort of lose track of of what is really important to us in our everyday lives. So I, I mean, again, I'm speculating. I get the science really isn't that developed here. Um, so I am speculating a little bit, but I suspect that that the reality of the fantasy would never be as appealing as sort of the the normalcy of of living a, a biological human life. I, I may be wrong there, but I think that that fantasies may pull after a while hmm. but then i but there is another aspect of that so i'd say say i'm right and again i'm speculating do we end up with a whole series of mental disorders where you go off into your virtual reality or whatever you're the hero you love living this life but then you realize actually you want some sort of normality but you can't pull back because you've had that experience you can't just forget about that experience so now you've got to deal with that duality mm -hmm. And, you know, one, one thing that this makes me think of, too, and again, like we're, we're kind of getting into more speculation, but um, it struck me, I think it was Ray Kurzweil who wrote about how um, our bodies, our physical bodies will just mm -hmm. become inconvenient. And it, right, it, it, yes. He, he calls them cumbersome maintenance rituals. So yes, he, yeah, he, just, he, just to sort of maintain he, our sort of consciousness and, and identity. Yes. What if we could replace them with machines? Yeah. But if I didn't have to eat or if I didn't have to sleep, I could live full time in, in the metaverse instead of having to. But then if I was to ask you how important to you is eating and sleep, let's just take eating. Is eating, I, let me ask, I'm sorry, I'm flipping this interview around, but let, <laughs> <laughs> let me ask both of you. Yeah, is, is, is eating just a function that you go through or is it part of your identity? 
No, it's a hundred percent a part of my identity. Like I love right. to cook. Like I love the smells. I love the texture. The t- like, right? Like. Well, but I, I'm thinking of like dinner time. Like the we talk a lot about like eating is a shared ritual. Mm-hmm. Something like even a cup of coffee. You know, those are those are shared experiences. Yeah, and I I think this is some where people sometimes lose touch with what it's truly like to be human because it's easy to say yeah you know eating is just so inconvenient what if we had a future where we didn't have to eat but effectively what you're doing is you're factoring out ninety percent of actually make what makes us who we are. <laughs> you're right. The whole human human element around eating it's not just the consuming of the food but it's it's everything around it that. Once you do right. that, then what what else is left? Nothing. That, that's right. And I think there are a lot of things like that. I mean, even sleep. Yes. I mean, I'm sure there are people that say sort of, you know, if I didn't have to sleep for eight hours a day, I could be far more productive. And yet I suspect to most people that that ability just to sort of slip into sleep and have that refreshed is actually important to who they are. Will, would you imagine it's possible to have um, like a very, you you mentioned uh, like weddings in, in mm-hmm. the past. Is it possible to have a real relationship and genuine human affections for someone that you haven't met in physical reality? So that that I think is is absolutely possible. Yes. Um, and, and this is something that intrigues me. And I, I don't think it's just the metaverse, but I think it's different ways of, of interacting. Um, we have absolutely seen over the last 10 or 20 years that the people can can develop deep and empathetic relationships with others who they've never met physically through the internet and through virtual means. Um, And I think that that's just part of us sort of um, being able to express our humanity in different ways in different media. So I think as, as the metaverse develops, you'll absolutely see that. But again, I think we have to be very careful to sort of talk about exactly what that looks like. Um, because it's not going to be an either or, it's not going to be either you live your life in reality or you live your life in virtual reality, but it's going to be how do you extend who you are into the media that is accessible to you? Is it? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I would actually just, actually just sort of um, add to that. So one of the reasons I, I say this, this is going back, goodness, 10 plus years now so when my daughter was uh, a preteen a teenager and she was part of a a youtube collaborative channel where um, there were six of them i think sort of posting videos every day and i would say some of her closest friendships come from that group there where she didn't meet any of them in person for about two years and and that actually that this was a sort of wake-up call to me um realizing that you could actually develop deep personal human relationships virtually um but it wasn't a substitute for real life it was an extension of real life yeah i I think that's another piece that would be that'd be new for us right or our kids talk about connecting with people through video games i'm like i'm not allowed to play with them like we don't we don't know them right at least through the very narrow lane of how they're interacting through whichever medium they're they're connecting through Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is really tricky, though. And of course, I mean, the flip side of that is and you bring up video games. There's all of these very real questions about who is it that you're really interacting with? Um, do you really know that person on the other end? But yeah. maybe that's part yeah. of the future. Who maybe they, that's part they of are isn't yeah, what they actually are. That, that's right. But maybe that's part of the future of the responsible metaverse, where the, the companies that develop these platforms and, and provide these services make sure that there are provisions so you can either see or know who you're interacting with and engaging with, or there are ways of finding that out. So it becomes increasingly hard to hide behind a facade. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I, that would probably be one of the most important things moving forward, right? That mm. we're not, even if it's that it becomes an extension of real life, and that it's not this this make believe world of you know I'm a in my avatar is a dragon who is you know it's like it, you need to show up in some way, shape, or form as who you are. That it's not right. a mystical place um, that is promising, over promising, and under delivering what's what's really behind. Right. It. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, we, we've kind of touched on um, some video games, um, but in terms of like companies that are working on sort of different mm-hmm. different angles towards like the next phase of what this will look like, um, I don't, are you able to give us an overview of 
any core things to look for from any companies right now? Um, it, 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 only in very, very general terms. So, of course, sort of Facebook, when they developed the the parent company, Meta, really sort of started sort of pushing this forward and put their their stamp of the metaverse on um, on this whole area. But since then, we've seen a lot, a lot of companies developing that are using this branding of the metaverse. So many that it, it's hard to sort of list them off. Um, but if you look at current financial projections, I forget what the latest are, but you're looking at a multi-billion dollar market um, in the next year or so, supposedly. I have a feeling that a lot of this is hype. I think a, a lot of companies think that people are investing in anything with the word meta on so that they're rebranding as sort of meta companies. So you're going to have this sort of usual sort of boomer bust where for the next sort of 12 months, everything seems to be rosy in the meta garden, and then it's going to collapse. And then you're going to see sort of something emerge um, after that. Um, but pretty much any company that is doing stuff online, whether it's sort of online finance or online gaming or online communities, is doing something around the metaverse at the moment, whether it's creating platforms or whether it's creating hardware. Um, so this is where it's sort of getting big. And, and the question is, is this going to take over, take off, or is it going to collapse at some point when people realize how much hype there is there? Yeah. Were there lessons learned from uh, the, the dot com? A bust right yes 2.0 and you know who's obviously that, no one wants to get left behind but yeah what are th that that's right and i you know i think still the jury is is out um I, certainly there are indications that adoption rates aren't as high as these companies would like um and so the the, the hype is sort of ahead of, of the adoption curve um, and I'm not sure how that's going to play out. And there are plenty of examples where you've seen similar things that haven't played out. So one of the things that intrigues me is um, 3D movies. Um, so you, movies where you can still go and sort of put the glasses on. They didn't really take off because people sort of saw this as a cool technology, but they realized what they really wanted is just the traditional 2D movie experience. Um, and I wonder whether Meta is going to be the same. I mean, it's technologically sort of um, intriguing, but it, I'm not sure yet that it's going to deliver what people really want. Yeah. I think of, um, Have you, are you familiar with uh, the book England, England? No. Um, you, you it, it came to my mind. I read this in grad school, actually. It's uh, by Julian Barnes. Um, mm hmm but the the premise of the the story is that uh, they uh, there's someone there's you know this this wealthy guy buys an island just off the the coast of England mm -hmm. and takes all of the like noteworthy elements of England all of the landmarks all of the historical figures mm -hmm. like so, so Robin Hood you know an actor you know portraying right. Robin Hood is there and um, you know they're able to go to Whitehall and you know you've, you've got like just everything that makes England what it is mm -hmm. as a tourist attraction. Right. What ends up happening is that people begin believing and acting like that is the real England. The real thing, yes. Hmm. Um, and then that's like the, one of the lines that I learned from that. Um, and then it was like, he has great connections to like the Matrix, for example, is like the substitution becomes the reality for people. Yes, Yep. And so when we're talking about relationships, when we're talking about uh, commerce, um, entertainment, you know, in many ways, like the metaverse right now feels like the the substitution or the attempted substitution to superimpose itself on like our lived yep. reality right now. Right. Yes. But then it, it it becomes the the very real thing. And I think like uh, the the physical U.S. dollar is an example in the book. Right. It's, it has no value, but it's right. Right. The value. It's become... it's become the real thing. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, I don't know whether we'll get there. And again, so yes, this is a large part of the speculation and um, sort of both the, um, the, the promise of the metaverse that, that you actually create something that eventually becomes the real thing, um, but also the peril that, that we lose touch of, of reality because of this, this substitution. Um, I don't think in fact, I think two things sort of um, suggest that that won't happen in the near future. One is the technology just isn't there. Um, we're making huge strides, but the technology is way, way too clunky at the moment and will be for some time. But the second one, which I keep coming back to, is just um, sort of our biological selves as humans and what we crave and what we need. 
Um, and I, it's almost like a, a, an elastic band. I think we'll sort of extend into the metaverse with this elastic band, but our human nature will pull us back. We'll sort of, we'll snap back to the things that we desperately crave, which are very, very real human experiences. Again, I may be wrong there. The elastic band may snap and we may find ourselves <laughs> in a substitution. Um, but I'm a little skeptical. I like that you're betting on humankind. That makes me feel better. <laughs> right. I will you know, see well, tonight for sure. <laughs> good, good. I, you know, there, there, are, there are also unpleasant aspects of, of humankind. So actually, I so and one of the things that, that does worry me here is if you really want to manipulate people. I, so this is absolutely a platform that you could use for manipulation because as soon as people are immersed, they are sort of almost at your mercy in terms of how you control that environment, what they're fed, what they're experienced. Um, and in this day and age of, of um, sort of deep fakes and AI generated fakes, I think it's going to become increasingly easy to plant ideas, and this is actually going back to inception, plant ideas into people's minds as they enter the metaverse that could actually resonate in, in the real world. And that does worry me. And that gets to the darker side of human nature. Right. When you're thinking about implants, it's like a push notification that like now you will buy from this company. Yeah, that's right. right. Yes. There's always someone behind you pulling the strings of what you're doing in the real world because it's in, in the synapses or something of your brain that you're not aware of. See that that's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. It's it's when you come out of the metaverse and you have that desperate craving for something and you wonder why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's even heightened the more immersive the environment and the experience. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so I could, yeah, depending on who who wields that and what what kinds of experiences we end up coming away with. And mm, yes. Planted. But yeah, I look back over the last, even the last uh decade, you know, and I see, well. I, I've I always said like no one goes to the YouTube comments section to get mm -hmm. smarter. Um, you find there's a lot of quality <laughs> things there, but also a lot of a lot of trolls, like almost like right. road rage, like something about the the distance and the anonymity of the internet like brings out some um, quirky qualities in, in many people that you wouldn't necessarily see face to face. Yeah. I wonder if the presence that we have um in the metaverse will will diminish the the, the you know just decrease the number of trolls uh that that are there um or increase it depending on like, yeah it's with their psyche i don't know um I, so again to me this comes back to asking sort of who is going to set the standard here actually i think there's there's a lot of opportunity for trolling and bullying in the the metaverse um and that to me suggests that that Everybody who has got a stake in this needs to be part of making sure that, that this doesn't happen. Maybe it'll be easier to control in the metaverse. I don't know. Um, but certainly there is that really nasty side of human nature that comes out with anonymity, where people feel as if they can get away with being unpleasant. Um, and hopefully there's a way of actually sort of factoring that out as, as the metaverse develops. <laughs> well, and you you don't have to think about now, like if I'm thinking about my kids, there are places that my kids cannot go as children mm -hmm. in the world right now. Right. And so when they build the metaverse and what it looks like and what people have access to, right? Like you, there has to be some some checks in that system, right? Like my my 10 year old can't walk into a strip club in the metaverse, can right. he? You know, and so, you know, what does that look like and, and who's in control and... and right, and, and, actually, and, as, and as you as parents, how do you know? I, I that's, that's what would worry me more than anything, I think, because yes, checks and balances can be put in place. Kids are remarkably good at working out how to get around those checks and balances, which then sort of brings it back to the, the, the people that are, uh, sort of have the close rela closest relationships with them. How do you monitor things? How do you tell what's happening in your kid's life? I don't have any good answers to that. Yeah. I heard someone say that you used to be a good parent if it's 10 o'clock at night and your kids were home, uh, they're home and they're in their beds. Now okay. that might not be the case if they yeah. have a phone with them yep. because who knows who they're talking to, what they're accessing. And unless parents you know, have a degree of control over uh, either the device itself or the way their child interacts with it. And so that's what I think of too, even going back to dinner, right? I mean, like that, that is a, like a, a special time for us. So mm. no phones at the dinner table, none for us, only our, our 12 year old has one and it's only allowed in the kitchen anyway. Um, so like building in, I, I think this is instructive for me, just knowing like, as these developments come up, we're answering questions that, you know, previous generations of parents right. have to answer, but having, at least some basic 
convictions and principles now uh, to act off of so that when we're encountered with new situations that we can only speculate about today, yep. we already know how we want to respond. I, I think that that is so important. I, it almost sort of feels like you need sort of the, the parenting manual for the technological age. I, how, how do you put those principles in place? So no matter what tech companies throw at you, you've at least got that grounding on how to be a good parent with your kids. Yeah. Um, another sci-fi reference. Have you watched the Netflix series Black Mirror at all? I have. I've I've watched a few of them. I'm very very familiar with it, but I I haven't indulged that much. But yes, I, I, it's one of those series which is spot on in terms of some of these gnarly questions. And um, I there's I can only watch one episode at a time because I get so weirded out by it. I'm, <laughs> right, I don't even right. see what they have in store for the next one. Um, but one other reference, one particular episode uh, that I don't think it's one, well, maybe it's one awards, but it's really good. It was uh, San Junipero. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it's kind of like a, a metaverse-ish uh, love story. And the, w the way it's it's told is very creative because you don't really know from the beginning as the narrative develops, like what exactly is taking place. But mm -hmm. um, you have essentially like old an old woman near death who's given the opportunity to have like a metaverse-like experience yes. as a young woman. Um, and then she ends up falling in love with, it turns out like someone else who is also like old, mm -hmm. you know, on the other side of the world. Um, and then, so this will be maybe the, the most we'll speculate, but by the end of this episode, uh, I think the, the woman physically dies, but has her consciousness uploaded into right. this, this metaverse-like application. Yes. Um, Again, I know we're only speculating, but uh, the technology is far, far away from this. But do you see or have you had conversations related to just those implications of just severing human consciousness? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I, and of course, this is a huge topic of conversation around people that are either looking at the next level of human evolution, the transhumanists, um, or... I even sort of beginning to think around philosophies of, of long-termism, sort of what's what does the future of humanity look like? Um, I actually think that a lot of thinking is very naive here. So to start off with, sort of think about that idea of, of severance where you retain your sort of consciousness, but you don't have your physical body. Um, that depends on sort of two assumptions. One is that our brains are sufficiently computer-like that we can sort of take all that stuff from our brains and shove them into a computer. And secondly, that our identity, our consciousness just resides in our brain. And we know that both of those are wrong, that our brains are incredibly sophisticated, but they don't behave or work like computers. And it's not just what's in our brain that determines us. It's our whole sort of central nervous system. I mean, even the microbes in our guts actually have an influence on how we perceive ourselves and how we behave and act. So, yeah, we're, we're not going to just sort of upload ourselves and be ourselves in some digital reality. But, and, and here's, here's the kicker to me, there is... In principle, nothing to stop us developing a technology where you can have to have a consciousness that was severed from a physical reality. It wouldn't be um, a human consciousness. It wouldn't be identical to sort of a human being that's living now, but it would be something that maybe is, is close to that. Um, and that gets interesting and weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it gets to to the extent. I mean, I, I actually go back to the the, the Black Mirror um, episode. So I'm pretty sure we'll never get to the point where you could just sort of sever and sort of live in digital reality. But we may get to the point where people try and do that, and that consciousness, which has that self awareness in digital reality, is different. It's got sort of it's got memories of what it was like to be human, but it is absolutely not that previous person. And that raises all sorts of interesting philosophical and moral questions. Um, but the other thing is, if we could sort of create these digital consciousnesses, um, what would that be like? And there are philosophers that are so concerned about that, that they're actually actively um, advocating that we don't develop this technology. Um, and it's a field called synthetic phenomenology. And you have you have philosophers out there saying we should put a ban on synthetic phenomenology down because we have no idea what we're doing here. <laughs> I feel like it's difficult to ban technologies. I, um, <laughs> of course it is. Some, you know, if we can do it, somebody's going to try somewhere. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I um, have heard too that you know some of these systems, you know, Facebook, for example, might have enough data on a given individual, the way that mm-hmm. they think, the way that they speak, the way that they gesticulate as they're mm-hmm. communicating, um, that in essence a an an, uh, an avatar, right, could potentially be be made of this person. So if I were right. to lose Rosanna. Um, I could take these podcast episodes. I could take you know, all the data points <laughs> that we have and recreate her and go visit and interact with her in the right, right, right. I, 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 <laughs> Rosanna, how do you feel about why? that? Why? But why? <laughs> Not no. Like if you, you just, lost, like I know, and I would think about the temptation, and I would never right. want to live without you. But that is the reality of what it means to be human. Yeah. That is th- that is an, an inevitability that I would have to go on. <laughs> that actually, that's exactly what I was going to say. I, these conversations intrigue me. So yes, you could do that. I, I Actually, I think all you could do is create a facsimile. It wouldn't be the real Rosanna. But the idea of a limited life and death are fundamental to our identity as humans. So if we begin to play around with this, are we effectively eroding something that is so important to who we are that we diminish who we are? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it comes back to again that question: of What does it what does it mean to be human? Be human, I What's know. Real? What is real? <laughs> is right, real? right. Yeah. To be real. Um, this has been, uh, I think, in some ways reassuring, in some ways, um, like kind of eye opening, uh, mm-hmm. or as maybe what we have to look forward to over the decades to come. Um, is there anything in particular that um, you're you're working on or anything that uh, anyone who's listening who has an interest in the metaverse or in your work in particular can uh, connect with you on or learn more from? Sure, actually, and, and this sort of feeds on exactly from that, that previous conversation. One of the things I'm doing at the moment that I'm very excited about is creating a, a community around this idea of what will it mean to be human in 100 years time? Um, And what I want is I want conversations where people from all different backgrounds, all different ideas, all different worldviews, all different educations can come together and explore what it might mean to be human when we have technologies that can potentially transform everything that that defines who we are. And then from those conversations, begin to think about, well, how does that affect how I think and act and behave in the real world? Um, So we actually have, we have a website. It's simply futureofbeinghuman.asu.edu. And we're just beginning to sort of build this. But if anybody's interested in this sort of conversation or exploration, I encourage them to check out the website. Um, and do you have any, uh, like a, a website or a social media or anything that, uh... yeah, so in my, my main website is simply just andrewmaynard.net and it has links to, um, all the stuff that I, I write my, my two books, as well as my, my internet presence, which I must confess is largely limited to Twitter. Um, I, I it shows how old I am. Um, You're I have an some... pandemic. That's all right. That's, that's, that's... <laughs> so, <laughs> Twitter. Yeah. Twitter yeah. Is, 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 is that a good thing or not? But yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do have, and Noah, uh, you'd mentioned your books. We do have, and we read through a copy of Future Rising, which is mm-hmm. the more recent of the two. It's yes, it's it's the latest of the the two books of the future that I've written. Yes, yes, Future Rising: A Journey from the Past to the Edge of Tomorrow. And um, the other one is films from the films future. from the future. Yes, the technology and morality of sci-fi movies. Which actually, even though it says it's about sci-fi movies, it's actually about everything we've talked about here. <laughs> with how do you develop new technologies in responsible ways? I've got some viewing to do because I I was surprised, but I did have not seen the majority of the films really represented in there. Yeah. So I I must confess I I that that book I mean it's it's a series of twelve movies that I used to kickstart conversations about the future. I spent quite a lot of time curating those, but but one of my most important factors was movies that I enjoyed watching and I would be happy to watch multiple times. <laughs> uh, so that you know there are some movies that really bombed there, but I still really enjoy them. <laughs> Um, and it's good, like, yeah, even uh, there's, I think, some films that are are so, so in terms of the, you know, the, the cultural reception. Absolutely. Of, yes. Uh, but they, they they really do make it worth talking about. Um, and so that, that's, you know, I, I think there's value there. And, and certainly the ones that I haven't seen, which is, like I said, the majority of the list. And I think mm-hmm. 
it's something we can if we can get the kids to bed <laughs> we can, something we can argue about the future. We, we can we can watch through together <laughs> yes yeah although actually here, here's the thing so i actually teach a course with these 12 movies um as well um which just intrigues me i've been doing this for a number of years now but one of the movies which my students enjoy the most is jurassic park it was made in 1993 this is an old movie um, but they get such a kick out of watching it. Um, and it's a family friendly movie. Well, actually, it depends sort of where your, your bars are because there's there's actually a lot of scary violence. Yeah, but it was made as a family friendly yeah. movie. Yeah, that I remember that was the only way I saw I saw it personally three times at the theater. Um, right. It made a big impression on me when I was young. Um, but that reminds me of, uh, and maybe we should close the conversation with the the original sci fi for me, which is Frankenstein. Um, oh yes Charles frankenstein um and right kind of that idea that is comes up now with scientific progression that uh the the more we create is there a uh, possibility for our creations to take on a life of their own um and to kind of get out of the control of the creator yes yeah, a great moral tale in that as, as well as in jurassic park or Ab absolutely yes and i actually uh, just to wrap up the one thing that i love about frankenstein um is who is the monster is it the thing that was created or is it the scientist that created it yeah most people don't know like the monster in the original frankenstein is super intelligent he reads that's right lost and he like it's it's fascinating character yeah yep yeah um, all right. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us uh, here. And like we said, eye-opening, obstructive, and sort of gives us a lot more to talk about. This yeah. has been a pleasure. Loved it. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks so much for listening to today's show. We hope you will use this conversation as a starting point for your own. We hope you're encouraged to think and act more intentionally. If you want to learn more, you can visit our website, therelentlesspursuitpodcast.com, where you can find notes on today's show, plus additional blog posts, and you can subscribe to our free members list. Please subscribe, leave a review, and share with your friends. Facebook and Instagram are two great places to connect with us for daily doses of our quotable quotes, behind the scenes, and real-time photos, videos, and challenges. Until next time, let us know how you are taking life off autopilot. And relentlessly pursuing what matters.